Hi there, it's Christy, and welcome to my series on the historical Jesus. In truth, this series has been on the shelf for about a year now, but I finally have the time to make it into what I think it should be, and I hope you enjoy it. There is a segment of the atheist community that is firmly committed to the idea that the Jesus of the Christian writings was a myth. What the word myth means itself can depend on whom you ask, but what connects the various and contradictory accounts of mythicists is that they think the texts are not based on an historical person whose life can be connected with the stories told about him. I'm going to lay out my cards on the table now and state that I think that this view has more in common with climate change deniers than with professional historians teaching at universities around the world, and explaining why I have reached that conclusion is the purpose of this series. The premise of my series is that we can evaluate the historical and mythical Jesus claims if we treat them as competing theories. Social scientists like me do this all the time. It's called model competition. Put two or more theories up against each other and use statistical methods to evaluate which explains more of the variance in the social phenomenon we want to study. Obviously, with ancient history, we can't run statistical tests, but we can evaluate which theory better fits and explains the evidence. I'm unaware of anyone else who has tried to examine the issue of the historical Jesus from this perspective. I could be wrong, but, you know, instead what I see are the mythical historical Jesus debates focusing on pieces of evidence and whether or not those pieces of evidence are credible. That's not going to be my approach. What is my approach, then? Let's start with the theory of a historical Jesus and go from there. By theory, I mean something very specific, a set of interrelated propositions or statements that attempt to explain some phenomenon. Now, what makes for a good theory? Here are a few common characteristics of good theories. Parsimony, the ability to explain phenomenon in relatively few terms and statements. It's also known as Occam's razor. It's not a guarantee that a theory is a good theory, but a simpler theory is generally preferable to a more complicated one if they explain the same amount of evidence. The breadth of the phenomenon explained, the more the better. If your theory can account for all of the observations, that's a really good theory. <laughs> Accuracy of the predictions of new phenomenon. In other words, how well is your theory able to account for information and evidence as it emerges through discovery? And is your theory able to be shown to be wrong? Could someone find evidence that would upend your theory and demonstrate that it wasn't correct? If a theory could never be shown to be wrong, then it's not really a good theory. Let's apply all this to a more well-known theory, the theory of evolution. It's attempting to explain the variation in life forms. Its interrelated propositions to explain that observation include variation in offspring, the idea that some variations will provide advantages to individuals due to changing pressures, whether they be natural selection or sexual selection, and that over centuries and millennia, these forces work together to produce variation in life forms. The theory of evolution is very parsimonious. Environmental and sexual selection pressures, plus variation in offspring that produce advantages or disadvantages, plus thousands of years. It's been able to explain every single observable life form on this earth it's not a predictive theory so much, but it is able to disprove with evidence. If we found modern rabbit bones next to dinosaur bones, then the theory of evolution would be in big trouble and in need of some reconsideration if that finding was accurate. Let's apply this thinking to the historical versus mythical Jesus debate. The first thing we start out with is the evidence. The evidence is what our theory has to explain. The evidence are the texts. That's what we have to look at, our ancient texts. And we cannot throw out evidence about Jesus any more than biologists are allowed to throw out observations that would call into question the theory of evolution. So that is the first principle of everything that follows in this video series. Theories are subordinate to evidence. Evidence is never subordinate to theory. If a theory cannot account for an observation, that's a strike against the theory it's not a reason to question the evidence. Given that we now know what we need to account for, all of the historical texts that are associated with Jesus, let's review the theory of an historical Jesus. I said before that a theory is a set of interrelated propositions or statements that attempt to explain some phenomenon. The interrelated statements here, my theory, are a very specific and narrow account of the life of an historical Jesus and how he became the Christian Messiah. This theory answers the questions, 
who, what, where, when, why, and how. It goes like this. A man named Jesus, or Yeshua in Aramaic, lived in the Galilee early in the first century of the Common Era. He was a Jew who came from the lower economic class, and a few years before his death, he began preaching an apocalyptic form of Judaism that was in vogue at the time. This man, Jesus, traveled around the Galilee, preaching his particular Pharisaic form of Judaism to Jews in the area, and he gathered a small following. Shortly before his death, he traveled to Jerusalem to take part in the Passover rituals. While there, he created a public disturbance that brought him to the attention of the Sadducees, the religious Jewish men who were collaborating with the Romans to run Jerusalem. A member of Jesus' inner circle told someone in authority that Jesus had been preaching that he was the Jewish Messiah, a Jewish king. And on this basis, the Romans arrested Jesus and executed him for treason or sedition because he claimed messiahship. After his death, his followers, including his brother James and closest disciple Peter, thought they saw him in visions or appearances and began preaching stories about his life along with the idea that he had been resurrected. Over time, these stories became exaggerated and mythicized until by the early 2nd century, most followers of Jesus believed he was some sort of divine being. What questions are answered? Well, who started everything off? Jesus of Nazareth. What did he preach? An apocalyptic version of Judaism. Where did this movement start? In the Galilee. When did it start? Sometime between 30 and 36 CE. Why did he do it? Jesus of Nazareth thought he was the Jewish Messiah. How did the word spread? His followers, in particular his brother James and his closest disciple Peter, led a group to spread the word about Jesus around the area. Before we move on, let's note things about this theory as I have laid it out. It provides a specific time frame. It provides specific actors. It lays out a very specific geographical location. It narrows the type of Judaism Jesus preached to a specific subset of several different forms of Judaism. It gives a time frame of events. It locates them within a specific historical setting. And in summary, this is what I'm calling the theory of the historical Jesus. This view is also the one that historians and experts in university departments across the world teach, with perhaps a handful of exceptions. We therefore have our theory for the historical Jesus. Will I now be presenting a mythical Jesus theory in this video series and evaluate both of them against each other? Well, I, I really can't, because unlike professional historians, mythicists disagree on what the word myth means, and mythicists also disagree with the way that the concept of Jesus relates to the idea of myth. Instead, I think it makes a lot more sense if I allow mythicists to state their theories and present them in the same way I laid out earlier. Have them explain the who, what, where, when, why, and how of their theoretical account. And to just prove that it's really not going to be possible for me to present a comparative mythical historical Jesus theory across the series in depth, the second video I will make is going to review the various and contradictory mythical Jesus ideas that exist out there. Right, let's get into things now by taking our first topic for examination, putting the historical Jesus theory to the test. The remnants of Aramaic words and phrases in otherwise Greek texts. Yep, I told you, we're going to be dealing with evidence, people. Let's get going and get into that evidence. We know people in the Galilee spoke Aramaic, but the Christian scriptures weren't written in Aramaic or in Hebrew, or in English, as some people today might think. They were written in Greek because that was the lingua franca, that was the international language of the time. Within these Greek texts, however, there are remnants of Aramaic words and phrases that have been preserved. For instance, in Mark 5, Jesus says, Talith kumi. Mark translates this in the passage for his readers. He writes, quote, it means, little girl, I say to you, arise, unquote. Mark also preserves the phrase, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, when Jesus is being crucified. He writes, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In John 1, 35-52, the word rabbi is used repeatedly, which means teacher in Aramaic. Messiah is used, which means Christ in the Greek, and Cephas which means Peter. 
One thing that any theory should be able to do is account for what we observe. Why do we observe the remnants of Aramaic, an obscure language not used in the rest of the Roman Empire, in texts that were specifically designed for an international audience? This is my challenge to mythicists. How do you account for the observed remnants of Aramaic language in a Greek text? Now, as an historical Jesus theory proponent, accounting for this observation is really easy. Our theory, of course, states that Jesus spoke Aramaic because he grew up in the area where Aramaic was spoken. The theory also states that after he died, his followers began preaching stories about his life in Aramaic, and these stories were eventually translated from Aramaic into Greek, but not every single word was translated. Some were preserved from the oral tradition as sort of linguistic fossils of their earlier oral versions. Any mythicist theory that wants to compete with my historical Jesus theory must be able to account for these observed Aramaic remnants in the writing of two different gospel writers, one which is our earliest gospel, Mark, and the other one which is our latest gospel, John. There's another challenge I'd like to present to mythicists, an explanation for the technique I will now present, a technique historians devised to distinguish later legends about Jesus, versus stories that can be traced back to an historical person. There's this interesting phenomenon where phrases and words used in some gospel stories make sense much better, or only make sense, when their Greek words are translated back into Aramaic. To me, this is undisputed evidence that the stories originated as Aramaic oral traditions first, and were translated into Greek later. Let's look at Mark 2.27. In the English translation of this passage, Jesus is quoted as saying, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath? To quote Professor Bart Ehrman, whose work, by the way, forms the core of this series, and I'll put links to his stuff below. What is the therefore, therefore? After all, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premise, does it? I mean, look at the passage. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath? Um, what? Once you know that in Aramaic, the word barnash, which is the word for man, can mean both man or son of man, son of man being the title used by the author of Mark to indicate the Messiah, you can insert that double meaning into its place. Sabbath was made for Barnash, not Barnash for the Sabbath. Therefore, Barnash is Lord of the Sabbath. When this story was translated into Greek, and also into English, some not-so-clever translator tried to improve Jesus' Messiah cred by using two different meanings of the word instead of a consistent one across the sentences. If we remove the Messiah cred agenda of the Greek translator, a consistent meaning for the term Barnash can be applied. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now the meaning is clear. Men are masters of the Sabbath because it was created for their sake. What doesn't make sense is to randomly throw in the title Son of Man being Lord of the Sabbath after that first sentence. The fact that the sentence makes more sense in Aramaic than in Greek is overwhelming evidence this story is a Greek translation of an earlier Aramaic oral tradition associated with an Aramaic speaking Jesus. However, this is not the only way the technique is used to separate out legends from more plausibly historically accurate stories. Let's look at the last gospel to be written, John. In John 3, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus where Jesus says, Very truly I say unto you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. At these words, Nicodemus becomes very confused because the Greek word for born from above, as in born from heaven, anathen, also means to be born again, a literal rebirth of coming out of the womb. The author portrays Nicodemus protesting the logic of this to Jesus, saying, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. You know, Jesus' stories are always set up to make sure that he comes out looking like the cleverest and coolest cat in the room. And that's also the case here. The Jesus of John's Gospel gets to correct Nicodemus' misunderstanding and show how cool he is by explaining, no, 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 I mean you have to be born spiritually from above, from heaven, right? The entire exchange depends on the double entendre of that Greek word, anathen, to set up the delivery for a theological punchline. 
What does the historical Jesus theory offer our understanding of this passage? Our theory states that Jesus did his preaching in Aramaic, not in Greek. If this story in John can be traced back to an Aramaic-speaking man, then the double entendre must work in Aramaic as well. And it doesn't. Like, like not at all. Unlike the passage in Mark, which became clearer and made more sense in Aramaic than in Greek, using the Aramaic word here instead of the Greek just ruins the point the author wants Jesus to make, because in Aramaic, it doesn't have that double meaning. From this, we can conclude that the author of John either made up this story to make a theological point, or he heard a story that someone else had invented who spoke Greek, but not Aramaic. In other words, this story can't go back to an historical Jesus, in contrast with the story in Mark, which can. Just to restate my overall point, we can observe passages in the text in Greek that make more sense in Aramaic than in Greek, and we have passages that only make sense if they are in Greek and make no sense if they are translated into Aramaic. The historical Jesus theory accounts for these observations. Mark's story was a Greek translation of an Aramaic oral story about Jesus. The original language does not make a theological pronouncement on Jesus' nature. It's a discussion of observing the Sabbath. A later translator with an agenda to increase Jesus' Messiah cred decided to poorly translate the Greek for theological reasons, hence the confusion that remains in the translation based on that Greek even today. Now in contrast, a later Jesus follower invented, or maybe adopted, a clever wordplay to make a theological point and put those words into the mouth of Jesus, the Jesus that he wanted to worship. Because the story was invented later by someone who didn't speak the same language as the historical Jesus, the word play fails to work in Aramaic, and this allows us to conclude that the story in John cannot be traced back to an historical Jesus. To close out the video, I just want to restate my challenge to mythicists from this first video. 1. Can you outline your theory of a mythical Jesus that answers the same questions I have, but of course adapted slightly? Who started things off? What was the name of the person, probably a man, who came up with the idea of a mythical Jesus? Give me a name. What did he preach? Can you state specifically what the original outline of the mythical Jesus belief system was? And how do you know? Where did it start? Please give a city or a specific region where the movement started. When did it start? Locate a specific time period in which the movement happened, just as I have done with the historical Jesus theory. Why did the person who invent the mythical Jesus do what he did? What was the motivation of the person who was spreading the first myth? And how did the myth spread? Was it an oral tradition at first, or was this written down? If it was written down, what's the earliest version of it? Who were the first converts? How did believers spread their message? Basically, account for all of the elements of the story that I've been able to account for with the historical Jesus theory. And then the next question would be, can you use that theory you've just set down to account for the use of Aramaic words and phrases? How does your theory help us understand the fact that when we translate passages from Mark, from Greek, back into Aramaic, the clarity of the sentence improves? Or how does your theory account for the fact that when you reverse translate passages from John from Greek into Aramaic, that they make no sense. How do you account for what we observe? I can do it with the historical Jesus theory. Now it's in your corner. Okay, everyone, just to let you know, I've already worked on three scripts for this series. I'm on vacation this week, and I'm hoping to get it all either written or written and recorded this week. I'm really looking forward to getting this series out, and I hope you are going to find it interesting and challenging. I think at this point all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy, you've been awesome, and I hope you're looking forward to the next episode and also coming up soon this week in Stupid Misogynist and another episode of Feminist Talk Back. Oh, I've got a lot of work to do. Okay, guys. Bye-bye.